that, yes, we just came out of Thanksgiving. And we do have a tendency of, even when we're talking to God, we know we're supposed to be thankful, but so often we're focused on the things that we're supposed to be thankful for that he did. Mm -hmm. But I really have had it on my heart this whole week about an expectancy and being thankful, and expectantly thankful. Thankful for the things still to come. We have so much going on around us in this world, and it'd be easy to get focused on, well, I gotta be thankful I have to think about the past because everything right now is absolute chaos and craziness. But the reality is that God is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever, tomorrow, forever. Forever, forever, forever. Amen. Amen. So let's focus on what he is doing and what he's going to do, too. Let's look at the first slide, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So this isn't talking about things from the past, is it? It's not talking about things that I have in the physical right here on this table. Faith is always looking forward to the things that we can't actually see right now. Mm -hmm. But in faith, we are thankful because we actually... You can put that scripture back up. Because we're, we are assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We, are, we have a conviction inside of us that what God has said is going to be. And we can trust it 100% even though we can't see it, right? Let's look at the next slide. Godly hope and godly expectations are synonymous. Psalm 62.5. And I'm showing you the New King James Version and the English Standard Version. The New King James Version says, My soul, and it's, you're commanding your soul. This is a great one to memorize if your soul lover gets out of shape. Because mm -hmm. you're allowed to command your soul. Mm -hmm. We actually have to take stewardship over our body, our soul, and our spirit. Yep. And with the authority of Jesus. Because yeah. yeah. those things get out of whack, don't they? Yeah. That's good. yeah. My soul waits silently for God, for my expectation is from Him. And then the English Standard Version says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from Him. Your hope and your expectations are connected, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They are synonymous. If you have hope, then you have an expectation. Sometimes we think it's dangerous. Well, mixed expectations are dangerous sometimes, aren't they? Mm. Yeah. We had, that's one of the main... Luna and I talked about that in our podcast, but one of the major issues in most relationships is expectations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uncommunicated expectations, unrealistic expectations. But we are actually told to have expectations and put our hope in things that are... What's the word right before him? From him. From, From him. him. Not in him. From him. Yes, thank you, Lord. So he gives us things, and we're, when he gives you a promise, he's giving you hope. He's giving you an expectation. Mm -hmm. Psalm 62, 5 commands our souls to wait silently for God alone. And the reason for this in the New King James Version is because my expectation is from him. He is trustworthy. He's our source of hope and expectations. We seek him, and he speaks and shows us accurate and dependable things. If we press into him, if we seek him, we will find him. find him. If we knock, the door will be open. Right? We have, those are promises. So those are expectations. <coughs> God wants to talk to you. He is trustworthy. He will speak to you. And he'll show you trustworthy things. And then you can put your hope in those things that are from him. Often we, if we get it wrong, it's because we're putting our expectations in things that are not from him. Paul writes to the church in Philippi in Philippians 1.20. We don't have a slide for it. But he says in Philippians 1.20, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. Hmm. When your hope and your expectations are God, or in God, from God, are from God, you can be like Paul. And you can expect that you will not be ashamed. What does it mean when you're ashamed? It means... You hoped in something and it didn't happen. It didn't come through. But God is trustworthy. And this is a dude that spent some time in prison, huh? And eventually was martyred. Thank you, Lord. He wasn't worried about God not coming through for him. When we have right expectations of our good father rooted in our faith relationship with him, we can live a fearless, joyful, and thankful life. Often we have a really hard, we, have, we often struggle with the ideas of joy and thankfulness. And that's because we don't know that we have hope and expectation from God. 
If we don't live in the hope and expectation from God, it's really, really hard to be joyful and thankful. Because you're living in hopes and expectations somewhere else. From something else. From someone else. And that's why we, got, we mess up so much in our relationships. If I put my hope and expectation in Sako, even though she's an amazing cook and she has never failed in the kitchen. <laughs> well, actually, it should come the other way. If Sako put all her hope and expectation in me, she would be continually set up to be irritated because I, I, I don't quite reach the standard. Right, Sako? But man, thank you, Lord. He is our safe place. He is our, he is our trustworthy attachment. Our condition is not determined by our circumstances. Right. Proverbs 10, 28. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Righteous hope brings joy. Well, wicked expectations perish. Let's look at the next one. Proverbs 23, 17 and 18. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all day. Surely, surely, surely there is. Is there a future? Yes. Amen. Yes. And your hope will not be cut off. Cut off. Man, thank you, Lord. And you can take that to the bank. Mm -hmm. Give thanks for all the, st the things still to come. Give thanks for the future. Yes, we are absolutely thankful for the things from the past that he's done, and even the things today. But we don't live there. We're also looking forward to the things to come. What, forth, what, what forthcoming promises are you holding? Are you paying attention to? Have you put your expectations and your hope in this, in this thing from God? These words from God. So as we talk about expectations, one example often used in the Bible is about farmers. So Mike can relate to some of this stuff. Right, Mike? When you live as a farmer, when you've lived as a farmer... You've had to recognize seasons, and farmers have done many things in the expectation and hope that God is going to do something else. Because so much of farming is out of your hands. There are things that are in your hands, and a whole lot of hope and expectation. Right? Yeah. 1 Corinthians 3, 7 says, only God gives growth. Does the farmer give growth? So what does the farmer do? He does his part. And he has expectations that God will bring the growth. God will bring the rain that is necessary, right? Mm -hmm. Farmers do what they can do, but they do this in expectancy of the Lord bringing the necessary rain and growth. So those integral, integral parts of the process are out of Mike's hands. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Mike takes each of those steps with patient expectation of God doing his part. And that's amazing because if you actually are a farmer, if you've lived as a farmer, you've actually learned how to trust God in ways that most of the people in our society don't. Because we live in a world where we think we actually have control of everything that we do. We don't. But if you're a farmer, you could continually have to recognize that. Let's look at James 5, 7, and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. So he's talking about the return of Jesus. And then who does he use for an example? See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So early rains, in, in the biblical farming seasons, early rain came in late fall, early winter. And they softened the ground so that you could cultivate the ground and till it and prepare it so that you could put the seed in it. The late rains come in early spring and bring growth to your final harvest. So first rain softens and late rain brings growth. The farmer can't control the rain, can he? No. After the first rain, he plows and sows seed. Then comes the late rain that waters the seed and brings growth. Then the farmer harvests. So be patient. The Lord is at hand, but first comes the late rain and one last opportunity for a great harvest. And I believe this is important for what the Lord is speaking today. I think he's giving us the scripture for a purpose. He's saying, be patient. But first comes the late rain and one last opportunity for a great harvest. So let's look real quick at the biblical farming season. 
I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. I just want to lay it out for you because it's a lot of us have no idea what in the world <laughs> the Bible's talking about when it talks about farming. But you see up here, we have our three fall feasts, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, right? Mm -hmm. And those usually happen in September and October. And then they have their olive harvest, which is October, November. And then we have our fall, winter, early rain. Then you have your sowing, which is December, January. You have your tending, which is January to March. And then comes the spring, the late rains. Then you have your grain harvest, April or May, and you have your four spring harvest, your uh, four spring feasts, which are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and weeks. And all of those four are done, right? Mm -hmm. They've all been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. The three during the fall have not been fulfilled, and we've talked about that a lot before. And so after that, they have their vine tending, which is June and July, and then their summer fruits are August. So usually, though, when we're talking about the harvest, usually Jesus' stories, if he's not talking about the vine, he's often talking about the wheat. And the wheat harvest happens before they celebrate those festivals mm -hmm. in the spring. So the Feast of Trumpets that celebrates his return takes place after the summer fruits harvest in August and before the olive harvest. The late rain, <clears throat> the late rain comes before the harvest. This is a great outpouring of Holy Spirit bringing a great harvest. And as James wrote, be patient for the Lord to do his part and remain expectant of both the great harvest and his return. So the coming of the Lord is at hand. Can I show you guys something? Uh, all of that, I just wanted to do a little bit of a setup for you guys because I really want us to be mindful, as I've said over and over again. Be awake, be alert to what the Lord is doing, and also have hope. Because as bad as it may look, God is plan He has plans and He is doing things. And if we'll listen, if we'll seek Him, it, you know, all this week I'm just talking to God and I'm saying, Lord, show me what I should be thankful. Uh, show me what I should be hopeful for. Mm -hmm. Give me glimpses of what You're doing. And I had a dream the evening before Thanksgiving that I was meeting with leaders of the Scandinavian countries in Europe. If you guys don't know, the Scandinavian countries in Europe are Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. I was meeting with these leaders, and they, came, they had just come to the revelation that their culture and their history is like, a, is like, oh, wait a second, none of this lines up with this woke movement going on in the world. <laughs> it was definitely a revelation because their eyes were suddenly opened and they started turning back to where they came from because they realized that their culture was more in alignment with a more conservative view. And then there was an, a rise in nationalism. And this can be good or bad. It's not necessarily good just because it's conservative and nationalistic. But this is opening the doors for a move of God in these countries. And just as there is this rise of conservatism and nationalism, there's also going to be an open door for the reformation of the church in these nations. So this is all in this dream I had on right before Thanksgiving. There's going to be spiritual revival and reformation of the church in these nations. And you think, well, they're long dead. Well, the long dead bones miraculously come alive. Amen. I woke up from that dream really encouraged. I wasn't thinking about Norway, Sweden, or Denmark. I wasn't thinking about Scandinavia. I wasn't thinking about Europe at all. But I went to sleep, I had a dream, I woke up hopeful that God is doing things in the nations, and even the nations that we don't really have any connection with, I don't know anybody over there, but he wanted to let us know, isn't he cool? If we seek, we find, and he actually wants to show us things. If we'll just go to him and say, Lord, show me, just show me, be excited. When you lay your head down at night, just be excited and say, Lord, here I am. If you wake up in the middle of the night, Say, Lord, here I am. He'll do that. Yep. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Prepare your minds for action. Stay alert and fix your hope firmly on the grace provided by Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be expectant. Fix your hope. Keep your hope locked onto God's grace. His grace is His supernatural kingdom ability to supersede the natural rules and processes and do the impossible and miraculous. The grace of God 
makes all the things that seem impossible, even in our personal lives and around the world, possible. So let's get locked into his grace. His grace is the power of Holy Spirit. It's the resurrection power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. It's his grace. So let's fix our hope firmly on his grace. His grace is resurrection power of his spirit living in us. His grace is the wind of the spirit that blows over the dry bones and makes them alive. Thank you, Lord. So I'm taking all these pieces and putting them together. This past Tuesday morning, I received a call from my sweet daughter. I just had breakfast with Nate and Israel and Elijah. And we had some deep spiritual conversation. And then I got a text in the middle of it, or actually a phone call first from my daughter, because her car battery was dead. <laughs> John, John. So, I'm such a great dad. You are. I am. You're good. I, I'm so You're awesome. Great. So I went out to her home, and we, we tried to jump in. It didn't work, so we pulled out her battery, went to AutoZone, got her a new battery, went back, plugged in her new battery, and ta-da! Resurrection! <laughs> Hallelujah! And that was Tuesday, yes, come alive, dry bones. That was Tuesday morning, Tuesday night. Toa came home late at night, then the next day, his battery was dead. Oh my God. <laughs> what a so, much, so, much. so we took out his battery, went to AutoZone, put a new battery in his car, and what happened? His car is resurrected. Hallelujah. Could the Lord be saying something to me? <laughs> yes, yes, he could. Yes, he could. And that one just happened to cost maybe $500. But hey, yeah. <laughs> the kids have two new car batteries. <laughs> just before I came, I got a text from my dear friend, Jan. Her battery was dead today. They had to take her to go get Oh, there you go. <laughs> batteries dying all over. There's batteries dying all over the place. And we can just blame it on the fact that we're in Texas and Oklahoma and the temperature goes, woo, 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 woo. But I think it's actually a little bit more than that, that the Holy Spirit's trying to speak to us and give us a message. We're going to need new batteries for this next season. We're yeah. going to need fresh power. Yeah. Okay? And so I'm going to connect that same idea, this, this fresh power, to the idea also of wind in just a minute. I, I just brought up 1 Peter 1.13, and it has these three points in it. Action versus surrender. Alert versus sleep. Attached versus separated. So say, prepare for action. Prepare for action. Hey, nice. Over here, can you guys do better? Say, stay alert. Stay alert. Yes, look at that. <laughs> oh, you guys, you guys didn't do it. Eh? All right, last one for the middle. Remain attached. Remain attached. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> The church is always in competition. <laughs> so we must remain attached, fixed to Jesus and our spiritual family so that the kingdom power will flow through our lives. Right? The worst thing we can do in times of great distress is surrender, sleep, and separate. But this is exactly what we're seeing, the line between the two. And so I want to encourage you guys, as members of the body of Christ, uh, action, alert, attached. Resist, surrender, sleep, and separation. When, go when the going gets tough, what do the tough do? Get going. And that is the church. That's right, and that is the church. When we're under extreme pressure or pain, we don't want to pray, do we? We don't want to read our Bibles. And we don't want to go to church. Most often, we'd rather choose surrender, sleep, and separation. Yeah. Victory requires resistance. Action, alert, attached. With everything in you, resist the other side. Mm. You weren't designed for that. You were not designed to quit. You weren't designed to put your head under the blankets, and you were not designed to be separated. Right. The one thing God said, this is not good, when he created everything else, was man to be alone. for man to be alone. If you ever think, well, I just got to get away from everybody. I just got to get separated. Just give me, a, give me a month not to see people. Trap. Mm -hmm. Trap. Thank you, Lord. So 
Look at your neighbor and tell them, choose action, alert, and attached. All right, now you're responsible for the people around you to make sure that they, they stay, choose action, alert, and attached. So these three words also describe one of our greatest responsibilities on the earth. Are you ready? Let's look at James 5.13. Are there any believers in your fellowship suffering great hardship and distress? Encourage them to pray. Isn't that awesome? When someone is distressed, the last thing they probably want to hear from you is, hey, well, you better pray. Because <laughs> we'd much rather pull the blanket over our heads and separate from everybody else, right? But I'm allowed to tell you that. And you're allowed to tell me that. The church is never a place of griping and moaning and not doing anything. There is always an action because we have an answer. And the answer is prayer. Yeah. I know a lot of people who are really distressed. Do you guys know some people that are distressed? Oh, yeah. And some of them get really angry when I give them the answer to their distress. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pray! <laughs> <laughs> Prayer is always the answer. Right now, it would be easy for us to be distressed by the news and everything going on in the world. There is a condition of distress that's over the nations. <laughs> What is our response to distress? Pray. 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 If we could just get that grilled into all of us. What is your response to distress? Pray. 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 When spiritual famine seems to sweep over our lives, what do we do? Pray. Pray. We pray for rain. Yeah. The Lord spoke the following phrase to me this past week. Birth the wind and expect the rain. And I know I've already given you guys, it's kind of been a whole lot of dis, disjointed stuff that I've thrown at you guys, but it's all these different pieces that God is bringing together. Birth the wind and expect the rain. We're talking about expectations. We're talking about prayer, right? Does this phrase make any sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. yes. Birthing and expecting are components of intercessory, pr intercessory prayer. I've never been a pregnant woman. I've been around some. Intimate with a one. one. <laughs> yes. Oh, stop. I, <laughs> well, I mean, I was there for the whole process yes. from beginning to end. As much as she wanted to get rid of me if, <laughs> at the end. <laughs> but uh, something about being a pregnant woman is, is you don't have a lot of control over what's going on inside of your body. You have a great responsibility for caring for this this child inside of you, right? But you're really trusting God like crazy, aren't you? There's a whole lot of trust involved in that. That most of us as men, we, we, we don't actually relate to. And we have to force ourselves to meditate on what women are going through so that we can try to relate to this. Because this is also at the core of prayer. Let's look at Isaiah 26, 17, and 18. And this is the amplified version. As a woman with child approaches the time to give birth, she is in pain and struggles and cries out in her labor. So we were before you, O Lord. We have been with child. We have twisted and struggled in labor. We gave birth as it seems only to wind. We could not accomplish salvation for the earth, nor were inhabitants of the world born. Now, this statement about giving birth to wind is often interpreted as birthing nothing. All the pain, all the groaning, and nothing came of it. Mm -hmm. And that's true for the world. Because as we talked about with expectations, the expectations of the wicked perish. Mm -hmm. So they're just birthing wind, as in nothing. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's worse than that, because Hosea 8-7 says, They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. You guys might have heard that quote in war movies and different things like that. And sometimes it's even used like it's a good thing. Uh, but if you look at where it came from in Hosea, it's how they, it's actually talking about how they sowed nothing and reaped judgment. Mm -hmm. But this week, as I read this scripture, I was actually encouraged. Because wind in the Hebrew is the word ruach. Mm, have you guys ever, ooh. ooh. Yes. <laughs> I was asking the wrong side of the room. Oh, sorry. 
Bam! I love that you guys know your Bible! Yay! <laughs> so what is, what is Ruach? Spirit. Spirit! Spirit! Ruach. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Bonus points. I like it. You go, Carolyn. <laughs> so that word, it means wind, breath, or spirit. Right? And throughout the Old Testament, Ruach is spirit. This is the equivalent to the Greek New Testament. Does anybody know the Greek, know the Greek word? Numa. Yes! Yeah. 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 Somebody give a high five. You get a Come on. There you, there you go. You got another brown noser over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have Numa in the New Testament. It actually means the same thing as Ruach does. It means wind, breath, breath spirit. Good. Good. So, <laughs> Honestly, when I first read this scripture, um, to the pure, all to the pure, all things are pure. And sometimes I confess I'm not always pure. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about someone birthing wind, I really struggled with that initially. <laughs> but, <laughs> but as I chewed on it, but actually as I chewed on it, I felt guilty at first. But then I thought, no, wait a second. There's a whole other example in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what does it mean when you're lactose intolerant? Stay here. Do that to me. Yeah, I grew up eating cereal and milk in the morning and then with every meal having a big glass of milk. So and when anybody told me in my, uh, that they were lactose intolerant, I thought they were lying because I didn't think that could actually exist. And then I married Sako, who's Japanese, and they have very little milk, so most of their country is lactose intolerant. And usually it's a part of how you're raised, right? And how you're raised determines how your body responds to milk. So what is your spiritual milk? What is it? The word. The, word. The, word. the word of God, the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> there's a lot of people that are lactose intolerant mm -hmm. because you actually haven't mm -hmm. developed a diet of the word. Mm -hmm. That's good. I know it's good. That's good. All right, right. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people when you try to give <laughs> the word to them, how do they respond? Mm -hmm. like, yes. <laughs> they get a really bad bellyache. And they actually end up adding to the toxic air in the world. <laughs> right? <laughs> the difference between the person who births toxic air and the person who births the wind of the Spirit is their consistent diet of the Word of God. So make the Word your sustenance. Make the Word your sustenance and prayer your lifestyle. Okay? We are not going to be, not a single one of us are going to be spiritually lactose intolerant. Yes. So then when we pray, we give birth to the Ruach, <laughs> the wind of God. It may not seem like we're causing immediate change in the natural. If we look at this from that perspective, so there's a laboring that goes on. We give birth, as it seems, only to wind. We could not accomplish salvation for the earth, nor were inhabitants of the world born. And I just want to take this and actually make it an actual good thing. Because you might not see what's going on in the natural, from your travelling and your intercessory prayers, but you can believe that you are birthing a wind of change. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. There is, going, there is, as we will partner with God in intercessory prayer, in the travelling, in the birthing, and allowing the heart of God to come in us, mm -hmm. and the compassion and power of God to operate through us, we can take hold of the fact that there is coming a fresh wind. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Lord. The wind of God will blow over dry bones and make miracles happening. That's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm ex my expectation is here. Mountain moving grace is released. Mm -hmm. The latter rains will come. And then we move to the next verse, and this is interesting. So we just read we just read 17 and 18. Now let's look at 19. Isaiah 26:19. What does it say? It says your dead will live. Their dead bodies will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is a dew of celestial light, heavenly, supernatural. And the earth will give birth to the spirits of the dead. Now let's go on to verse 20 and 21. 
Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until the Lord's wrath is past. Listen carefully. The Lord is about to come out of his heavenly place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their wickedness, their sin, their injustice, their wrongdoing. The earth will reveal the innocent blood shed upon her and will no longer cover her slain. So taking these three chunks of Isaiah 26, we see prayer will birth the spiritual winds of revival. Resurrection will take place. Then comes the terrible day of vindication. Now, some of the times we're so caught up in judgment and what's going wrong with the world and what's coming. Yes, the day of judgment is coming. The day of vindication. Yes, it's coming. But what happens before that? There's going to be a mighty move of the wind of God. There's going to be resurrection power. Yeah. And then Jesus is coming back. And it says, <laughs> go to your houses and lock your doors. And this is a great picture of Egypt. Because what did they do? Mm -hmm. They painted their doors with the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. And all those who have responded up before this last point, responded to the blood of Jesus, <laughs> they are secure. When the world answers to God about the blood that's covered the earth. <coughs> the blood of the innocents. Right? In this season of great distress, our responsibility is to take a position of birthing. Mm. All of us. Not just Debbie. Okay? Not just Sue. Not just Jeff. Not just the people who have called, God has called to these different levels. They're awesome. They're forerunners. They're examples. But all of us are being called yeah. to a life of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all of us are called to get down into a position of prayer mm -hmm. and start birthing things into the world. Yeah. And pray for the fresh wind and the release of Holy Spirit over the nations. Yeah. That dream about Scandinavian countries, God is saying, hey, this is going to happen if you guys will pray for the wind to be released. Mm -hmm. Don't give up. <coughs> Don't surrender. Don't sleep. Don't separate. Mm -hmm. Get ready for action. Mm -hmm. Be alert. Mm -hmm. Stay attached. Yeah. We intercede for the coming awakening and reformation and revival. We birth the winds of revival and the Lord is going to bring the needed rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can expect the rain. Because mm -hmm. guess what? It blows in with the wind. Thank you, Lord. Birth the wind and expect the rain. And this supernatural movement will precede his return, the resurrection, and the judgment. Let's look at James 5, 17 and 18. This is a wonderful example for us. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Guess what? That means he was just like you and me. He wasn't special. He was just like me. And he was just like you. Okay? We have a tendency to look at our Bible heroes and think, oh man, I just wish I could be like that person. <laughs> They're just normal people. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. That's a lot of time not to rain. Mm -hmm. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. The, he the, heaven, the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. And I believe that's a word for us. There is still a time for rain and there is still a time for fruit. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the story of Elijah? What they're talking about right here? Mm -hmm. When he challenged the prophets of Baal? Mm -hmm. It's funny, huh? I love that story. <laughs> Elijah was a comedian. Mm -hmm. He was a violent comedian. <laughs> he challenged the prophets of Baal to a duel of the gods. Remember he mocked them because he said their, their God didn't show up. Where was, where was their God? He was on the toilet. <laughs> yep. He was lactose intolerant. That's right. <laughs> it was Yahweh versus Bell. When Yahweh was present, Bell didn't show up. So then what happened? Elijah killed them all. He killed all the prophets of Bell. And then after the showdown, Elijah made a prophetic declaration. And then he prayed in the rain. Okay? So let's look at that. 1 Kings 18, 41 to 43. It says... And Elijah said to Ahab, go up and eat. This is his prophetic declaration. For there is a sound of the rushing of rain. He heard something in the spirit. That wasn't in the natural. He heard something in the spirit and he made a declaration. So Ahab, because Ahab trusted him after the... I mean, Ahab was a really simple guy, actually. He just listened to whoever was talking to him. But Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. 
And look at this. He bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. That's the birthing position. Mm -hmm. And he said to his servant, his servant, <clears throat> go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again. How many times? Seven. Seven, Seven times. Again, notice that Elijah heard something in the spirit that no one else heard. Mm -hmm. Right? You guys start listening to the spirit. So that you can make declarations and then you can intercede for those things. Mm -hmm. Because the things that you hear in the spirit go back to one of our first scriptures. Those are expectations from God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's your hope from God. Yeah. That's a good word. Yeah, that's a good word, right? Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I'm chewing on this one too. Then in faith he proclaimed what he heard in the spirit. Next he took up a birthing position and prayed. And let's go to the next verse. 1 Kings 18, 44 through 46. And at the seventh time, <clears throat> he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And, a, and in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and what? Wind. Wind. And there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. I love that story. That old dude, man. He outran a chariot. So Elijah gave birth as it seems. Is that what that verse said? Yeah. Only to wind, right? And what quickly followed the wind? Remember, it hadn't rained in three years and six months. That's seven rain seasons. It had not rained for seven rain seasons. Three years of no early rains in the fall and winter. Three years of no late rains in the spring. And then half a year of no rain meant another missed early rain. Okay? So then suddenly after Elijah's prayers and the wind, finally came the late rains. So only the late rains came. Once the late rains came, things picked up really quickly as the Lord was on Elijah. Mm -hmm. Birth the wind and expect the rain. This is what the Lord is saying to us. Right now it's time to for all of us to really take hold of the call to intercession. Mm -hmm. But if we'll do that, if we'll take hold of the expectations from God, and the hope from God, and we'll jump into that calling that he's, he's beckoning his bride to, the world is going to be impacted by this incredible wind of God. Yeah. And we can count on it, and we can believe in it, and we get to participate in it. He is saying right now, birth the wind with your prayers. Be an Elijah to this generation. And what does the spirit of Elijah do? It brings the sons and daughters back to the fathers. Right? It brings the rebellious back to the wisdom of the elders. Be the spirit of Elijah. Birth this wind. And it also says in the word, when, when in, that, in Luke 1, when they're talking about the spirit of Elijah and the things I just said, the end of that scripture, it says... Um, Preparing a people for the return of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So if we will take on this calling to intercession and the birthing of this mighty move of God, the rain is, we can expect it. Yeah. It's, coming. it's coming. And when that rain comes, <coughs> there's going to be an outpouring like we've never seen before. Yeah. And then we will see the greatest harvest like we've never seen in our lives. Good. Because we have been in a season where it's been season after season and there has been no rain. Or there's been a little sprinkle over here in Canada. There's been a little sprinkle over here in Florida. There's been a little sprinkle over here somewhere in Africa and in China. But there hasn't been a massive outpouring that all the earth needs. And we're believing for that. There's going to be a late rain that calls forth the greatest harvest we've ever seen in our lives. Things look bad. There's a lot of distress. All the news wants you to think is that it's all over. Yeah. You might as well just buy a camper and get out while you can. <coughs> but 
Great things are in store for those who set their hearts, yeah. set their hope, set their expectations on things from the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We do our part and God does his part. Yeah. And his part's so much greater. In this time of increasing distress, we must increase our prayer lives. It's not a choice. It's not something to put off. It's an absolute. That's right. It's the calling of the church. We, as the governing body of Christ, this is what we do. We are the Elijahs. All of us. Elijah prayed seven times. Seven is perfection, divine completion. Each time he prayed, he sent his servant to check, right? He prayed with expectation. Mm -hmm. Why did he send his servant? Because he knew something was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Something was forming. He prayed with expectation. And right at the perfect number of prayers, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. <clears throat> Don't be tempted to stop praying. And if you haven't started, don't be tempted to not start. <laughs> Let's be like Elijah. Pray. Pray again. Pray again. Pray again. Pray again. Pray again. Pray again. And when God says everything is complete and perfect and ready, we're going to feel a wind blow across the nations. And you know what? There's going to be some people freaking out. They're going to be freaking out because Hosea said, they're thinking about it like Hosea was talking about. They're thinking about the whirlwind. But that's not what we're, we're waiting on. That's not what we're believing for. So over here, yes, it's going to be a whirlwind for, for those who have refused to repent and come to Jesus. But for the kingdom of God, it's going to be a move, a resurrection power in the church. An increase in birthing in the nations that have seemed long dead. Birth the wind and expect the rain. How many of you guys are ready to see a mighty move of God? Amen. <clears throat> I am. Hallelujah. I am. So when you guys go back to Oklahoma, dedicate yourselves to another level of prayer in your lives. And believe that it's not just because I stood up here and said to, it's because there's a calling of God. Yeah. And it's awesome that you guys are already praying. It's awesome. You're in the right direction. Turn up the volume. Turn up the volume. Pray again. Pray again. Pray again. And maybe you should start singing people to look out the window. <laughs>